Alan Hirsch Advisors, creating aha moments, presents Aha Business Podcasts. We provide opportunities to discover information to help you run your business and guide your decision making. The more you know, the better decisions you make. For more information, log on to alanhirschadvisors.com. I'm your host, Alan Hirsch. Attention business owners, has your business suffered financially from COVID-19? If so, let us help. I am Alan Hirsch, a member of Business Coaches Assembled under a grant from the Small Business Breakthrough Executive Team. Our mission is to help business owners who have seen their revenues negatively impacted by 20% or more due to the virus. We can help you recover 50,000 to 70,000 or more of your lost revenue over the next 90 to 120 days. For more information, go to www.ahaonlinelearning.com to receive my book, 45 Minute Breakthroughs. That's go to www.ahaonlinelearning.com. Uh, welcome to today's podcast. My guest today is Ed Barks of Barks Communications. Uh, thank you for being here, Ed. I really appreciate it. Uh, my first question to most guests is, what motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Well, Alan, uh, thanks for having me. And, and in terms of motivation, uh, the thing I try to keep in mind is that it's not about me. It's about those I advise, whether it's, it's in person, whether it's remote, or whether it's somebody that reads one of my books or reads my blog. It's about delivering practical communications advice they can use to advance their, their business and their public policy goals. And that's what I try to keep in mind. So, I mean, you know, how do, how do we as spokespeople improve our interview media skills? How do you coach them to improve those skills? Well, it's essentially twofold. First is practice, of course, that's number one. And number two is having a plan, a sustained professional development plan. Now, there are times when I will get called by a prospective client and, and the conversation goes something like this. Can you come in and do a media training for two or three of our executives? And of course, the answer is typically yes, unless there's a, a conflict or some other reason for not getting engaged with that client. Um, however, I, I, I try to expand their horizons by indicating that, that a one-time affair is, it'll do some good around the edges and people will improve probably. However, it's not the, the maximum that they could be doing for their professional development efforts and, and for their, their outreach efforts through the media. So it's a matter of having a sustained professional development plan. And it doesn't mean, you know, coming to me every week, it could be something internal, it could be something they read, it could be something they do on their own. However, there has to be a plan and that's how people get better over time. Okay, so what goes into making, well, first of all, you've, you've also got a book out uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Reporters Don't Hate You. Uh, uh, and I guess they don't, but sometimes you feel that way. Uh, uh, well, you know, it's, it's funny because sometimes it, it, it's, it's an attitude as well. Um, many spokespeople I've encountered over 20 plus years consulting on these issues have uh, gone into it with some trepidation, thinking that reporters are really out to get them. And, you know, in the vast majority of cases, that's just not reality. Uh, now, there will be some instances where if your company, for instance, is involved in some kind of scandal or there's a crisis, yes, you may get some really tough questions. However, in most cases, reporters are looking to, to you for information, looking to fill out a story, an article. So it, it's, it's a matter of, of trying to adjust uh, spokespeople's views with the title of the book, Reporters Don't Hate You, to give some insights into the fact that it shouldn't be necessarily a, a relationship based on conflict. Right. I mean, uh, I mean I've done some uh, media interviews and so forth, and going back to the, I guess, to the early 70s, we did an interview for the Sun Papers here in Baltimore. And no, it was about doing a story uh, on, on the company that, you know, was... Uh, 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 85, 90 years old or something. Uh, and it was, it was a, a great piece, but they weren't out to get us. Uh, they're not out to get you unless you've done something wrong, in Generally which case true. they might be, yeah. but, and then you're, then you're in, in a defense mode 
and you shouldn't necessarily be talking to them in the first place. But uh, uh, so how do you how do you help to improve with the, the plan? What do those plans deal with? Well, it really depends on the individual and where they are in their career and their abilities as a spokesperson for their company. Uh, for instance, if it's, let's say, somebody in the C-suite that you would hope by the time they reach that, they've got some, some communication skills under their belt, and they're reasonably good, if not very good, at communicating in public. That is a different program from somebody who they may be grooming to become a spokesperson. It could be on a very narrow issue. Maybe somebody is a specialist in one area that the company is involved with. And they just need somebody to walk reporters through some of the specifics about that, that initiative or that product. That person needs a little more uh, handholding, if you will, and they need a different plan, a more basic plan than somebody who is, uh, again, has that, that level of experience already. So in either case, what, what you know, in the, the working with the experienced CEO, what goes into that plan? Because a lot of them think they know what they're talking about uh, and think they know how to present themselves. And many of them don't, they, they just go about doing it. So when you're working with them, what, what are the, some of the things that, that you work with? Well, and that's many times where as a consultant, I, I can come into play and provide more value to the, the company. And, and, and it's in this respect, it, it, when I worked, for instance, in association life many years ago before I opened my consultancy, despite the fact we had a very robust uh, media training program internally, at least every so often we would call in a consultant from outside to kind of lay down the law, if you will, to our executives so that they could, number one, get a different perspective, hear it from a different voice. But also as a consultant, I can say things that an internal person, an internal media relations uh, officer may not want to say because they kind of like their job and would like to come back to it again tomorrow. So you know, that's part of the deal in terms of uh, the, what that program looks like is, is having somebody come in who can kind of lay all the cards on the table. Now, in terms of specifics, what might that plan include? It, it's, it's really a, a basic learning program for that individual. And it could include things, some for instances here. It could include some mock interviews. It could include uh, doing occasional Q&A refreshers with their internal staff, where even for five, 10 minutes between meetings, they can um, hop on Zoom or hop on the phone and bat some Q&A back and forth just to get used to that type of structure. Uh, it could also be a, a situation where you have uh, them being interviewed by a reporter, quote unquote, somebody either from their staff or an outside consultant uh, who will interview that spokesperson for maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, over the phone or over Zoom, and then write an article based upon that turn that article around within an hour to an hour and a half, send it back as a learning moment for that individual, and then get back into a conversation with them and ask them, what do you think of the headline? Is that what you intended to get across? How about that quote that they chose to use? Is that one you would use or would there be something else that, that you could have said instead? So it, it, it's, it's a variety of learning experiences, again, depending what that individual needs and where they are and along that, uh, that, that continuum of being a communicator. I, I remember uh, uh, sitting down with uh, someone who's in public speaking uh, here in Baltimore before I did my first radio show, actually uh, it's, uh, exactly seven years ago next week, I started doing a live talk radio show and it was about speech patterns. It was about the uhs, the ums, and the, which don't really belong in the speech pattern in, in public. And it's about pausing rather than saying them. And uh, I just did it. Uh, <laughs> don't we all? Uh, yeah, we, we, most of us do. And it's interesting that I, I pick it up from other people when I see it, but I don't say anything. Uh, so is that part of the training? Is it the, the training to get the people to clarify the way they want to speak? Yeah, absolutely. Communication skills is a big part of it. And, and whether that's, that's how you speak, whether it's your nonverbal capabilities, 
those are all pieces of the puzzle. In, in terms of what you just mentioned, which is interesting about the, the what what the, the academics call speech disfluencies, the ums, right. the ahs, the errs, uh, those are the kinds of things that you will find some consultants and, and, and some people wanting to totally knock out of everybody's conversation. I, I'm not in that crowd. I, I, I think it, it's perfectly appropriate because it, I, in a conversational uh, uh, conversational type of interview with a reporter, you want to sound conversational. That's what it is. It's a dialogue. Right. So, I mean, that's now, how I, I run these interviews. I, I do it strictly by getting a group of questions. I, my script is, is less than a half a page. And it's, it's, we just naturally go through what, what it is you do. Yeah. Now, I will say too, I, I will add that if the ums, the ers, the ahs become overwhelming and they become a distraction, well then, yes, we need to do something to try to, to remedy that. Mm -hmm. But by and large, most of us are, um, are, are okay with those types of things. Uh, that there is a, a very well-known um, speaking organization that, that tries to knock out every um and er. I'm just not in that camp. Yeah. So let's, let's move on a little bit. So, you know, uh, when, you, when you refer to an exchange with a reporter, you think it as a business deal. What do you mean by that? Well, that's exactly what it is. And I, I, it, it helps to think of it in transactional purposes for many spokespeople, and it helps to put it into context for them. It, it, when you think about it, it is a business deal. It's like going to the supermarket, you, you pick the loaf of bread off the shelf, you put it on the belt, cashier rings it up, you get the bread, they get the money. Mm -hmm. With a reporter, it's the same type of exchange where you have the information and the expertise. The reporter wants to get that from you. So that's an exchange of, of goods as well. Now, I will point out with a reporter, let's hope there is no money changing hands. <laughs> uh, however, it, it is a business deal. Well, there, there are a lot of magazines that sell their space to, uh, for interviews, uh, particularly here in Baltimore now. There's, I mean, with the uh, pandemic, a number of magazines have been doing it for years. Another, uh, some have, have been moving towards that. So it's, it's no longer a competition. You're, you're actually promoting your own business by submitting your ar articles or having their reporter interview you uh, as part of a business deal. Yeah, that, that kind of pay for play is, is in my mind, a, a, a really, really bad ethical move. Uh, it, it, it's one where you, you're, the, the media outlet is in effect trying to sneak one by the reader or the viewer or the listener. It, it, it's just not something that ethically I, I would advise clients to do. Well, I, I agree with you. Very few, you know, I don't do those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I just got a proposal from a local newspaper here that uh, wanted me to write some things on what I do. And it came to me as a uh, offer to pay as an advertising. And I, I'm not into that. I, I get paid for what I write. That's right. Or, That's or right. write it for nothing. I'll do that. But I won't write it uh, and, and pay to have it written. You know, and, and that's, that's to me is absolutely unethical. Yep, I'm with you. Uh, uh, so in, in terms of working with a reporter, what means off the record and on background and what does all that mean? Well, you know, it's interesting because I've done some research on this and talked to some very smart journalists and communicators about what all this means in an effort to try to get some consistency around those definitions. They can mean different things to different people. And, and the key for a media spokesperson is to spell out exactly what you mean with the reporter ahead of time. So for instance, when we talk about off the record, that means that the reporter can use what it is you give them, but they cannot attribute it to you in any way, shape or form. And, and they can only use it in the sense of trying to develop another source for that information. <laughs> they can't publish it based on what you say. They can't put your name in the article. However, they can take what you've given them, which oftentimes is used as a steering mechanism by some companies and some spokespeople to get the reporter to cover a particular issue with the particular angle they'd like to see. So it, it's, you know, the, the report that I, I, I did, can we talk off the record? 
the report that I published really goes into these definitions and talks about you know, what they are, when to use them, and when not to use them. I, I will say the rule of thumb is is in in at least you know ninety five times out of a hundred, just stay on the record. Just which means that everything you say, everything you do, can be used, characterized by the reporter. For instance, let's say you and I are doing this interview and, and you were doing a write-up on it for a, pub, a print publication of some sort. Well, you would be within your rights as a reporter to look at the background behind me and characterize anything back there. For instance, you could say something like, you know, Barks talked about his book with the book on, the, on his bookcase Bookshelf. over his shoulder. So you know, the, 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 anything you say, anything you do, anything that, that is on your walls that the reporter can see, that's all fair game. But that's the best way to handle an interview is to stay on the record because then you don't really need to think about what you should say, what you should not say. The, the other cautionary note I'll pass along is that only very experienced media relations pros should negotiate these, uh, the, these on the record and on background conversations with reporters. If you're a spokespeople that doesn't deal with the press day in, day out, please stay away from that. Let the experts do the negotiating well, in that case. Yeah, well, my daughter was uh, worked for the mayor of New York running his communications office. So uh, uh, I know a little bit about uh, her headaches of trying to make sure what he said could be used on the record and keep, keep quiet about the stuff that he wanted off the record. So everything, everything could be used. Uh, and it was like pulling teeth, but it was, <laughs> it was very interesting that uh, uh, the kinds of things that, that could be said or shouldn't be said. Uh, but you're right with an interview, you're being interviewed, you should be able to say what you mean and put it on the record. Sure, unless there's a compelling reason otherwise, absolutely. If there is, then shut up about it. Excuse the Greek. Uh, be quiet about it. Don't don't use it. Uh, uh, avoid it. Well, I, I will say that these tools have their value. And, and let me give you an example. Again, I'll go back to my time working for an association where I was in the press shop and we strongly preferred that our members, the, the, the president, the vice president and so forth, would be the ones who issued the quotes and got their names in the paper. I was perfectly willing all day long to talk to reporters on background and give them the information they needed. However, what that means is while they could use the information, they could not cite me nor quote me. Very happy to arrange a time for them to talk to one of our officers so that they could get the quotes from them. So it, it has its useful purposes for many companies. Yeah, uh, we're going to take a break here. We've got a couple commercials. So when we come back, I will continue my conversation with uh, Ed Barks of Barks Communications. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, and this is AHA Business Podcast. Hi, Rick Dempsey here. As a former Oriole and Series MVP, I know a lot about winning and championship teams. Today, I am happy to tell you about my award-winning web design and internet marketing team, Adventure Web Interactive. For over two decades, many of Maryland's most successful firms have chosen Adventure Web as their strategic partner for web design and online marketing. I can tell you from using them personally, their search engine optimization and social media programs have saved their clients tens of thousands over the traditional pay-per-click digital agency. Visit AdventureWebInteractive.com and listen to what clients such as Hercules Fence, TriStar Electric, ABC Rental, Rhine Landscaping, Markdown's Office Furniture, and many more highly successful firms have to say. And don't forget to tell them Rick Dempsey sent you. Strengthen, protect, and preserve your retirement nest egg. Scott Garceau here for the Stephen J. Sless Group, Baltimore's reverse mortgage specialist. Reverse mortgages have evolved to become a viable retirement tool. Enjoy retirement without monthly mortgage payments, improve cash flow, pay off debt, and stretch retirement savings. Stephen and his team can offer strategies to make housing wealth work for you. If you're 62 or older, learn if a reverse mortgage could help. Visit ReverseBaltimore.com. An equal housing opportunity lender. This is not a commitment to lend. Stephen J. Sless, NMLS 298581. BRMI, NMLS 3094. Welcome back to the show. My guest this, uh, this afternoon is Ed Barks of Barks Communications. He's also the author of the book, Reporters Don't Hate You. Uh, it's a great title, by the way. 
uh, and I like it. Uh, so tell me more about the book. Uh, it contains the definitions and so forth. And why is it helpful for CEOs and business owners um, and business people to read and use your book as a reference? Well, what I wanted to try to do, Alan, was, was to put a, a book together that, that combined all the, the aspects of media relations that, that spokespeople and their media relations shop need to know. And let me just explain the division there. Spokesperson I'm, I'm referencing as somebody who is actually speaking to reporters. They're getting their names in quotes. They're getting on video, for example. The media relations people are the ones that have the expertise. In, they actually work in the media relations shop in, within the company. And they are the ones that are advising uh, their spokespeople. They're the ones that are putting together the messaging for the spokespeople and so forth. So that, that's kind of the, the dividing line there. In, in terms of the book itself, you know, it, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of, of um, pandemic history here, early pandemic history. <laughs> I had originally planned to publish another book uh, in 2019. Uh, however, when the pandemic struck in February, March, April timeframe, it became very difficult to get interviews with the experts that I needed to interview, because at that point, nobody knew what the world was going to look like tomorrow, let alone next month or six months from now. So as a result, I, I, I shifted gears and turned to a book that, that I had most of the information already in hand or, or up here, or was able to talk to enough people to, to get something uh, useful together. Um, so in the course of two and a half months from start to finished, I published finish, I published Reporters Don't Hate You. You know, the, the 100 tips plus that are in Reporters Don't Hate You uh, really revolve around a number of different areas in media relations. For example, there's advice and it's broken out by sections, what to do to prepare for an interview what to do during an interview, whether it's, it's a, a telephone interview, whether it's a television interview, no matter what it may be, how can you prepare? Uh, there's a section on how to deal with Q&A and some techniques for handling reporters' questions that, that you might find challenging. And then I, I think one of the most important pieces that, that's often ignored by some companies and some spokespeople is the notion of what to do afterwards. How can you take what you've done, build on that, learn, go forward, and become even better next time. So what are some of the hints that, uh, what can, what can uh, companies do to prepare for them? And how do they prepare for them? Uh, and what's some of the messages that they want to, uh, to present? I yeah, guess that, of, that becomes the important part, what the message is. Absolutely, and in terms of preparation, that is one of the main tenets, is having a message that is magnetic, that is ready to go. And that takes some time to develop. So companies in preparation for an interview or a media campaign have to decide what their messaging is. And that's a process. It's not a matter of somebody in the communication shop sitting down, banging out a couple of pages and saying, here it is. It's a collaborative effort with the C-suite, with the issue experts that are involved, and of course, with the communication staff as well. And if it's an advocacy issue, obviously you wanna pull in your public policy and government relations staff too. So it's getting that message fine-tuned. It's, it's testing it with a series of, of questions, for example, to see how that message stands up to questioning. And then it's giving it a test drive and seeing how it, how it resonates with reporters which again is why that post-interview process is so important because that should, you should be looking there among other things at how did your message perform and how did your spokespeople perform at delivering that message. So you, you talk about in your book, uh, uh, you actually have a featured glossary. Uh, why is that important? What's the significance of it? The reporter's glossary is there, again, to, to as with when we talked about a few moments ago, the, the off the record question. There's, there, there's a lack of a standard definition. And so it is with many terms in the journalistic realm. It, it's a lack of standard definition, or perhaps in some cases, a lack of understanding by media relations staff that may not be quite up to speed or quite senior enough to, or experienced enough to, to have that knowledge. So it's, it's defining everything from A to Z, from above the fold to wire services and beyond that will give a common understanding of, 
of these terms to media relations professionals so that when they are engaging with reporters, they know what those terms mean and frankly, they'll sound smarter. Yeah, should one of the things that uh, uh, small mid-sized businesses uh, should or shouldn't do uh, is hire public relation firms to help them in the interview and in the uh, process of working with reporters uh, and with the media. What is your opinion on, on hiring those media firms? Well, uh, as a communications consultant, I come at this obviously with a certain <laughs> point of view. Uh, I, I will say that, that there is not you know, one good fit for every company and every organization out there. And let me give you an example. Okay. I, I tend to work for the most part with Fortune 1000, Inc. 500 and large associations. Now, if a small local nonprofit were to come to me and, and ask for assistance, we may not be a good match. Uh, on the other hand, they may find a match for somebody who is really good and really specializes in those types of organizations, but just would be hopelessly in over their head trying to deal with a Fortune 1000 crisis. So it, it, it really depends on what you need. And you have to be, as a company, very careful when you hire um, uh, communication specialists from the outside, because there are a lot of good ones, and there are a lot of, well, ones <laughs> there are that a lot of good know, ones and a lot of bad ones. I don't quite know their stuff as well, shall right. we say. Uh, uh, I mean, so, and, yeah. so I have, I've put together a, a buyer's guide for communication strategy consultants that, that's on my website at barkscom.com that, that lays out some of those questions that, that companies should be asking as they search for that kind of help. Yeah. You also talk about when you deal with Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, that uh, uh, make the argument that most of these companies should actually have former journalists on staff because they can help tremendously with the, uh, uh, with the promotion and, and media relations. Uh, how does that work? Do you, is that something you, you support? What do you, where are you on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I fail to understand how any company of any size could run a media relations shop without former reporters there. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's just, it, it's what those people can do is to translate from the media to the C-suite and to other spokespeople what it takes to be successful in the press. And they can be that, that advocate within the company uh, for reaching out more thoroughly to the media. You know, I'm, I'm sure we've all experienced this in some way, shape or form during our careers where the, the organization we work for is hesitant to reach out to the press because they think they're going to get burned. Having a former reporter in the media relations shop can help remedy some of that. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the biggest things that have changed in the last year uh, is uh, Media relations have gone just like everything else to Zoom and Teams and other other networking, uh, online networking. How has that changed what you're doing? You know, it's it's interesting, and I get this question a lot from colleagues and, and clients and prospective clients. And and my answer tends to surprise many people. And the answer is it hasn't changed a lot. It really hasn't changed a lot. Think of what needs to remain the same. You still need a magnetic message. You still need the communication skills to deliver it. You still need the ability to deal with questions and answers. You still need to have some insights into the press. You need to be able to target the, those press outlets that would do you the most good and, and on and on and on. On the other hand, weigh that list against what has changed. One thing, the technology. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. So if, and I think that's helpful to people who are feeling overwhelmed by having to do interviews on Zoom, don't, over, don't overload yourself. It's one thing has changed, and that is the technology. Get used to using the technology, be facile with it, understand it, and know what the reporter is going to need from you based in using that technology. However, don't think it's an entirely new ballgame because it's not. Mm -hmm. So what do you see in the future? Do you see, uh, you know, a, a year from now, six months from now, what do you see changing in the media relations or don't you see a change? Well, I'm gonna take a big leap here because for the last 10 months or so, I've been telling clients, 
you really can't plan for anything for any length of time into the future. Nonetheless, I'm going to try the crystal ball trick here. And, and here's what I'm thinking. Um, because we've had some time to settle down. You know, the first two, three, four months, everybody was, uh, me included, kind of panicking to try to figure out what, what to do next? do next. And when do we do it? And now I think it's settled into enough of a, I guess I'll call it a routine, that we have some sense of what things might look like. And here's my, my guess, and I admit it's only a guess. We will likely evolve at some point into a hybrid situation for media interviews. What I mean by that is we will go back when we are able to safely go back to a situation where there might be in-studio interviews. There might be reporters coming out to interview you without you know, the, the six-foot length of, of uh, microphone extension that they need now. So I, I think some of that will come back, and I certainly hope so. However, I also fully suspect that interviews over technologies like Zoom and like Skype and like others will continue to be a part of the media landscape. And here's why. A couple of reasons. First of all, viewers have gotten accustomed now to the occasional glitches in transmission. They don't expect perfection. We, we've all now become attuned to the fact the video may crinkle every now and then and the audio may fade out. So th there's, there's some, uh, some notion of the, that this is a useful tool that will stick around. The other thing is, media companies for over a decade now have been cutting budgets furiously. And if they don't have to send out more crews and if they don't have to hire more people to do the job and they can do these interviews over Zoom, that's a cost saving for them. So those are a couple of reasons why I think we will eventually evolve into some kind of hybrid style. Mm -hmm. So one of the problems, or I don't know if it's a problem, some companies are putting off uh, programs, media, uh, uh, media training, so forth. Is there a danger in this? Yeah, I mean, if they don't want to achieve their business and public policy goals, no danger at all. <laughs> um, however, those companies that, that want to stay in the hunt, whatever their, their initiative or their product might be, and they, they really do need to continue that, that sustained professional development we talked about earlier for their spokespeople. So it, it, it's a matter of, uh, as I talked about a moment ago, it, we're not in that necessarily in that panicky situation anymore. We were for the first couple of months. I, I sense from clients and from others that, that things have now kind of settled down. Everybody understands we are not going to get in the same room to do, for instance, a media training workshop. It's right. just not safe to do that. There are things we can do over technologies like the ones we're using now on video that will supplant that or, or, or at least reinforce it for the short term. And then when we're able to get back to meeting in person, then we can do that. And then again, we may want to, to, to build some of these uh, technologies into the, uh, that sustained plan going forward as well. Yeah. So is there anything else that uh, uh, you'd like to say to the listening audience uh, that we might have left out uh, that could be helpful? Well, again, I'll come back to the notion that it really revolves around a sustained plan if you want to get better at dealing with the press. You, know, you, you just have to be a sponge for information. You can get that information from internal colleagues, from external consultants, from reading. And you know, all of us have this wonderful, for the most part, free tool available to us. It's called turn on the TV, watch a couple of interviews on some of the news channels or on your local news channel. It's called looking at uh, online news sources and seeing what gets quoted and, and, and ask yourself, why do you think the reporter used that quote? So a lot of this can be done individually. And of course, the smart individuals, the ones who really want to get better and raise their profiles and that of their company, understand that they're gonna need some guidance as well along the way. So look for trusted sources of guidance that you can turn to. Okay. Well, I want to thank you, Ed, for being on the podcast today. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being on the show. How can our listeners reach you if they want uh, some information on uh, media and, and dealing in those kinds of relationships? Thank you. The easiest way is through my website, which is barkscom.com. That's B-A-R-K-S-C-O-M. 
www.jmm.com. And when you get there on the homepage, scroll down and you're going to see a box that says Join Ed's Communications Community. That there's a special bonus there if you if you join the community and you also get twice monthly refreshers on some of these media, public speaking and advocacy tips that can help you along the way. Okay, well, thank you very much for being here, uh, being on the show. I really appreciate it. The pleasure was uh, mine, Alan. Thank you. Well, it's, it's my pleasure to do it. So it's my pleasure to have you. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, your host. To reach me, go to my website, www.ahaonlinelearning.com and register to get my book, 45 Minute Breakthroughs. You can listen to the podcast of past shows wherever you get your podcasts by subscribing to AHA Business Podcasts. You may look, follow me on LinkedIn at Alan Hirsch. I'm Alan Hirsch, and this has been AHA Business Podcast. Have a great day.